It's the furthest north you can go in Canada. Referred to by the Inuit as the place at the top of the world. A mere 720 kilometers from the North Pole, Kutinirpak National Park offers up an endless bounty of riches for the senses, for the mind, and for the soul. But the landscape is changing, and it's changing fast. The last three years, for example, we've seen ice shelves that have been around for thousands of years collapse and disintegrate and move off into the sea. There's a big push to fund things like where does the shelf end? Where does Canada end? Where do our resource limits end? Who owns these riches up here? So it, it'll be a new battle zone. This is where the future of our planet is being written. You can see it on the landscape, and you can see it in our actions. Can we turn back the clock and minimize our impact on the Earth? Will even greater access to resources bring more exploration to the area? Will it even be possible to preserve and protect this natural wonderland? First visited by humans around 4,000 years ago, Inuit people and their predecessors have understood the beauty of this place for millennia. Ancient food caches, like this Thule one at Kettle Lake, date back more than 1,000 years, and they can be found all around the park. There's hundreds of sites in this park. Certainly, the more we look, the more we find. And we're finding that they're sort of using the same areas of interest that we have now. Perched at the top of the globe between the 81st and 83rd parallel, this area was officially unfolded into the national park system in 1988. As far as parks go, it's massive. At 37,775 square kilometers, it's about the size of Sweden. We're extremely remote here. The closest community is between uh, 800 and 1,000 kilometers away. So by creating a park so far north, uh, one of our main rules here is to have a presence in the north and to show that as Canadians that we have sovereignty over the most northerly part of the landmass up here. During the short summer season, it falls on the shoulders of about six parks personnel to manage this enormous, diverse landscape. Within park boundaries lie thousand meter thick ice caps, pristine mountain faces, and frigid glacial rivers. All action within the park fans out from three base camps. Tankery Fjord in the south quadrant, Lake Hazen near the center, and Ward Hunt Island at the northern edge. On average, annual visitors number in the dozens. And this far north, Summer days and nights are bathed in 24 hours of sunlight. Scientists, visitors, and parks personnel access the park via charter Twin Otter aircraft. After that, travel is mostly on foot. 
this is arguably one of the best backpacking parks in the world. Crossing its glacial rivers is a bone-chilling experience. We're looking at the McDonald River here, and it's uh, pouring into Tankery Fjord. This is one of the most common hazard in our park, the river crossing. If you lose your backpack, there's potential of you um, freezing and being able to rewarm yourself and not be able to cook and make hot water. So it's very important to, to cross in a way that, you know, you keep your backpack secure and you make it across to the other side. So uh, a bit more, a few more uh, braids to cross, and other than, other than that, the main part, uh, the worst part is over. Yeah, sounds good. We'll warm the feet up after. <laughs> Painter Corey Trepanier and his brother Carl are two of the park's visitors this summer. As an artist, my primary goal when I come out into nature is to paint the landscape. What I've found through my travels into the Western Arctic, the Eastern Arctic, and now here, is that as a result of getting to where I want to paint and going through that process, I encounter culture uh, along the way in history, which makes my experience as an artist and as a person so much more rich. Shirt blades from this Independence One site near Tankery Fjord date back more than 3,000 years. There's uh, a piece of shirt there. The, the blades they were making out of shirt, the edge of it was only a couple of microns thick. You think of a scalpel or exacto blade, that's hundreds of microns thick. Sites like these are visual reminders of the nomadic people that lived here for millennia their footprint on the landscape, barely a whisper. Inaccessibility of the far north kept this habitat unspoiled for thousands of years. But its strategic location and natural riches would not stay hidden forever. With the next wave of explorers, the doors to the north would be cracked open. The ensuing legacy not so kind to the environment. Kutinirpak National Park on northern Ellesmere Island has a rich legacy of exploration. For early European and American explorers, this area was the gateway to finding the North Pole. In the late 1800s, explorers like George Nares, Adolphus Greeley, and Robert Peary spent years mapping these fringes of the North. On the eastern side of the park, within eyeshot of Greenland, lies Fort Conger, base camp for the original explorers. Today, it's a site of international historic significance. The story we tell here is expeditions that relied on their own technology at the time didn't fare too well. Nares came here, he, four of his men died. They gave up, they went south. Greeley came here and his story is well known. There were 26 men and of the 26 men, Seven survived. When Robert Peary came here in the late 1800s, there was one large building erected by Greeley's camp years earlier. Peary recognized that Greeley's huge building uh, wasn't adequate to overwinter here. So he dismantled it and made three smaller buildings. So kind of in style of way Inuit would make hummocks or sod houses uh, and or igloos. Make a much smaller 
easier to heat. So instead of being cold and wet all the time, Puri and his uh, few men that were here, they were in their underwear uh, or toasty warm in their little hut. By using local Inuit from Greenland to help guide him and adapting to their way of life, Peary and his men survived. He wore their fur clothing. He was nice and warm. He was eating fresh meat. He traveled by dog team so he could cover great distances rather quickly. What Peary and his predecessors also kicked off was a legacy of leaving behind what you were unable to carry back. To some, these tin cans and bed frames are historical artifacts of the great age of Arctic exploration. To others, they are unsightly piles of garbage. There's a mountain of tin refuse uh, cans, and they're lined with lead. And we have a source of water nearby, so we don't want that going into there. But at the same time, a lot of these things here are deemed artifacts and of historical significance. It will have to be uh, reviewed and decide what they're going to do with this ultimately. Fort Conger is just one of a number of sites identified by Parks Canada in need of some attention. The lead from the tin cans is just the tip of the iceberg. In the Cold War era of the 1950s and 1960s, the Defense Research Board operated a number of camps in the far north. To preserve the ecosystem, Parks Canada has teamed up with the Environmental Sciences Group, a branch of the Royal Military College. They specialize in the assessment and cleanup of contaminated sites. So they're testing the soils, seeing what kind of contaminants are in the soils. And then once they have all the tests done back south, usually, then they come back and excavate whatever soils need to be excavated. What began in 2004 with five initial cleanup sites has been expanded to seven locations. Katrina Jackson is spearheading the cleanup on Ward Hunt Island. What we're doing right here at this site is cleaning up some former burn pits um, that were probably used in the 1960s to get rid of some of the garbage and other waste. This particular burn pit, it looks like, was used um, to burn some electronic waste. There's a lot of battery debris and some wires and other things that we couldn't identify. Getting rid of the debris is just the beginning. There's toxic metals in the ground. They'll be there forever. And they can migrate too. If, if they're leachable metals, they will leach into the water and spread out over a larger area. So it's important to get them out of the park um, as soon as we can. The soil particles here are laced with toxic remnants of lead, copper, and zinc. Respirators are a must to prevent inhaling any of the hazardous particles. We've already sampled this area and we realized it was contaminated. So we're setting up a grid and checking to make sure we got all the soil that was contaminated. And then uh, we'll go back and test it in our lab make sure that it, the soil samples are clean. Sealed barrels filled with contaminated earth and debris will then make the long journey south. The only way that parks can get things in and out of here is by twin otter. So we have to wait until we can get a twin otter in here specifically just to take the soil out. Different sites require different treatments. 
High on Gilman Glacier, about 10 kilometers from Lake Hazen, is another contaminated site from the 1950s. First order of business is to survey the site and get a sense of what they're dealing with. Oh, wow. All right there, the uh, Danish, by appointment to the Royal Danish Court, Danish bacon. Historically, it's very interesting to see. It's a very typical camp to find uh, from the old days before it was a park and there was research. Uh, the, the batteries all kind of left in a pile, the domestic garbage sort of in another pile, wood and barrels scattered. That, that's a very typical scenario for the old research camps because, uh, you know, even today, a lot of research camps, it's easy to put them in. It's really hard to pull everything out because uh, uh, because of weather, because of people's budgets and things like that. So it's quite typical, but it's very interesting at the same time. After the initial survey, it's time to get dirty. The contents of the barrels determine the future disposal method. With the assessment and sampling finished, tackling what to take out will have to wait until next summer. The ongoing cleanup in the park is erasing some of the blemishes on the landscape. But up here, the impact of climate change is shaping the park in ways we may not be able to reverse. At nearly 38,000 square kilometers, Kutinirpak is Canada's second largest national park. This cold, dry, polar desert is home to musk ox, arctic wolf, arctic hare, seals, endangered piri caribou, and 30 species of migrating shore and seabirds. Wildlife is sparsely scattered over its vast landscape. Year after year, it seems this habitat is changing right before our eyes. Here in this park at the top of Ellesmere Island, we see visible evidence of change. Uh, last year, for example, temperatures rose to 20 degrees. That's, that's a spectacular temperature for this far north. And it is like being inside an ice palace that is falling apart around you as temperatures rise up to that level. Uh, we were seeing ice shelves that have been around for thousands of years, cracking off and disintegrating and completely disappearing. Uh, the Markham Ice Shelf, for example, last year, lost completely. Uh, the Warthunt Ice Shelf, the largest ice shelf in the Northern Hemisphere, cracked into a million pieces and we lost uh, a very substantial part of it. From last year when it broke off, you could see the crack kind of running from Warthunt Island all the way to the other side onto the mainland of Ellesmere Island. It's estimated that in one year alone, about 23% of the ancient ice shelf was lost. This park is critically important for uh, monitoring the effects of climate change because it is, first of all, so far north. It's at the northern limit of North America. And so in terms of monitoring climate, in terms of monitoring changes in the environment, this is really the place to be as a global monitoring site. Dr. Vincent and his students have been working in the park for about 12 seasons. Their understanding of the unique aquatic ecosystems here and the changes they are undergoing helps paint a picture of where we are heading.
Over at Lake Hazen, Dr. Vincent St. Louis and his Eddie Covariance flux tower are adding to the picture. Measuring atmospheric CO2 concentrations over time, their data will help increase awareness of how the landscape is reacting to warmer temperatures. Will the region become more productive or less productive? Here we are measuring primary production, and that's the base of the food web. And in, in a place like this, um, there's a lot more herbivores than there are carnivores, you know, so muskox, caribou, hare, you know, they all rely on, on this, this landscape. And uh, for, for northern people, you know, these are all part of their traditional way of life. Spring started earlier last year than this year, uh, but this year it's been much hotter than it was last year. Over time, we'll be able to see if you know the, this landscape behaves differently in a cold summer compared to a hot summer. For the people of the North, climate change is a real social issue. We're hearing more about people falling through the ice or, you know, patterns of things that they've been able to rely on in the past with regards to hunting or fishing or, or whatever. It is, it's just changing. In climate change, there are winners and there are losers. Uh, the losers are these uh, unusual systems that, are, that exist right at the moment. But there are new systems developing. As these uh, coastlines open up, uh, new food chains will start developing. Uh, so this is really a, an environment in transition. And we are living at a very special time to be able to be able to track this period of transition. You know, I keep joking that if uh, this wasn't a national park, I'd be buying property on Lake Hazen, because <laughs> I think in 50 years, it'll be a nice place to summer holiday. <laughs> You know, just two days ago, I believe it was, it was 20 degrees Celsius, and we're at one of the most northern parts of, of Canada. We're supposed to be in the Arctic. 20 degrees Celsius, it's, it's warm. It's hot up here. What will this park look like in 2050? Will places like this still be here? A canoe trip at 1 a.m. at the top of the world. Riding Mountain National Park is a unique intersection of several distinct ecosystems. Boreal forest, mixed woodlands, wetlands, and prairie. It's cottage country for thousands of Manitobans who return to the park every year during the summer months. Set amid a working agricultural landscape, the park acts as an oasis for many plant and animal species. And keeping an ecological balance is a tough job. We know that inside a national park, things usually are going on pretty much the way nature intended them to go on. But it's outside of the borders of the park that we have those significant areas that are being impacted by humans. Managing this complex intersection of wildlife, agriculture, and recreation is an ongoing challenge. It's a challenge the park has faced head-on 
for over 75 years. Riding Mountain National Park has evolved into a playground that embraces the collision of civilization and wilderness. Tucked into southern Manitoba, this 3,000 square kilometer gem has been designated by UNESCO as a biosphere core. A key symbol of their mandate is no fences, but that means everyone has to get along. When a beaver crosses the boundary, is it still a park beaver when it enters the province, or is it a provincial beaver now, and it's their problem or our problem? And uh, when there's a storm in the park and uh, water races out of the park and floods fields, there's always that conflict. Conservation is a two-way street. The people that live around the park are the same as the people that live in the park, is we all love this place. And uh, even though the beavers may flood your land or flood your road or block your culvert, just the fact that you've got beaver and you've got elk and you've got bears and wolves, it makes this a unique place. Wildlife thrives inside the park. The densities of, of wildlife, in particular elk and deer and moose, are some of the highest densities of wildlife in North America here in, the, in this area. And part of that reason is because of the richness of the vegetation. It's productive because of the edge effect. It's, yeah, wildlife like to be at the edge of various ecosystems, so they have a variety of different foods and, and uh, cover for the available to them. This diverse biosphere is perfect for wildlife and a magnet for tourists. Every year, 250,000 visitors come to the region. And there's one part of the park that's visited by everyone. The town, Wasagami. During the 1930s, depression relief workers were instrumental in building the park. It was during this time that the rustic design tradition was adopted in many of Canada's national parks. Here, the Eastgate Registration Complex is a prime example of this style. This is the last gate, entrance gate, to the national parks. Each of the parks, Banff, Jasper, all of them had their own particular architectural style, but each park had its own gate with a sort of a member over top of the, the highway or the, the road entrance way with the two columns, some sort of a style like that. This is the last standing gate. But heritage isn't the only reason people are coming to Riding Mountain they are also attracted to its reputation for being a great natural playground. It's a hive of activity with more than 700 camping sites and 300 hotel and cabin units. Riding Mountain's core biosphere is made up of a system of lakes and none more popular than Clear Lake. but its delicate ecological balance is in jeopardy, prompting parks, local residents, and visitors to do all they can to keep it clear.
Clear Lake is the most popular spot to visit in Riding Mountain National Park. Its beaches, swimming, and boating have been attracting Canadians for over 100 years. But keeping the clear in Clear Lake is an ongoing balancing act between the park's ecology and its visitors. Nutrients such as phosphorus from human waste can get into the lake and cause algae growth, turning clear water into green water. We started doing water quality monitoring on the lake to get baseline information about it. Implementing programs that protect the lake and still allow visitors to enjoy the park is not an easy task. The problem with nutrient pollution is that it causes the growth of plants and algae. And the plants and algae then start competing for oxygen that's needed for the freshwater species of fish. So right now what we're doing is we've upgraded our technology for our wastewater, like our sewage, uh, was 1950s technology. In its time, it was state of the art, but we're quite a few years after that. So what we're doing right now is we're redeveloping our sewage lagoon system our wastewater system, so that any of the effluent that's coming out into Clear Lake through the marsh system is as clean as it can possibly be. It wasn't until they monitored the water quality that they found a fragile mechanism that helps keep the lake clear. Clear Lake is mainly ground-fed, and that water is high in calcite. This mineral binds with phosphorus, which then sinks to the bottom, keeping the water clear. But if nutrient pollution alters the lake's mineral balance, the lake could go green. Thousands of visitors will stop coming. So we have to balance off the sort of the human use and enjoyment side with the protection aspect. To help monitor Clear Lake's delicate balance, researchers keep close tabs on its indicator species. Two of the species that are really important to us that are kind of our canaries in a coal mine, per se, are lake whitefish and slimy sculpin. Lake whitefish has commercial value in other locations in Canada, but it's a large sport fish. Uh, versus the slimy sculpin, a small uh, minnow-like fish about the size of your thumb, and it lives pretty much on the bottom of the lake, and they require good oxygenated water. So if they're present, you know that the quality of the water is probably fairly good. Monitoring water clarity and chemistry are just some of the tests park staff perform, all in an effort to ensure the lake keeps its famous name. Okay, here's your water sample, I'll get a bottle for you. By making sure indicator species like the slimy sculpin and lake whitefish are healthy, they gain a deeper understanding of the lake's ecosystem. So far, Mother Nature is doing a pretty good job. But without intervention, condition of the lake could deteriorate rapidly. We're fortunate by the fact that the current nutrient loading in the lake Though it's there, and though we have issues, Clear Lake is in good shape. Being at the top, in ecological terms, means depending on a whole system for support. Large mammals like elk and deer are part of an interconnected food web in the area. As indicators of the bigger picture, when entire systems thrive, they thrive. But managing wildlife disease inside and outside the park becomes a whole new challenge when it's carried into neighboring farm communities. One of the best ways to maintain sustainable diversity is without boundaries. But in 1945, on Riding Mountain's grassland, bovine tuberculosis was discovered in their bison. The entire herd was replaced with healthy animals.
Today, a disease-free display herd can be seen near Lake Audi. We have about 44 bison uh, here in the park, and it gives people an opportunity to get a sense of what uh, this place was like 100 years ago when there were bison roaming the prairies and the, the forest. With little suitable habitat remaining outside the park, this is an ideal spot where they can roam. What I'm doing here is we have a, a, a male elk call and a female elk call, and just trying to get response. Uh, from the elk, see if there's any elk in the area, because um, it's quite majestic, uh, especially early in the morning and late at night. It's uh, an awesome experience for our visitors to, when they come here to Riding Mountain. The more than 3,000 elk and deer in the park are evidence of a thriving ecosystem. Unfortunately, in 1991, Bovine TB was found in a cattle herd adjacent to the park. And in 1992, it was found in elk and white-tailed deer. The battle was on again. Today's solution is not as easy as simply removing the herd. Instead, the park began an elaborate research and monitoring strategy to help eradicate the disease. Sounds like you should be going this way. Oh. Ooh, nice. No bones. Oh, it's yeah. got that uh, drop-off oh. hosey thing that we put in there. Yeah. In six months, we just splice in a piece of uh, cotton fire hose so that it, it's much weaker than the leather of the, uh, the collar itself. So over time, hopefully within six months or so, the cotton fire hose will wear away and drop off the animal so the animal isn't wearing it for the rest of its life. This was on our cow elk, so it, uh, it's out there somewhere. And it was negative on all the blood tests, so we're not too concerned about it. If it wasn't negative on all the blood tests that we took, this animal would have been removed from the population. Well, sometimes we come across these collars, get, them, get the locations from the air and mortality, and if we were lucky, we would have come in on a wolf kill and there would have been bones scattered around. Uh, we hopefully would have gotten the, uh, the skull from the animal and been able to take a tooth from it uh, just to get the age on the animal when it was killed. And uh, if there was a femur here as well, we would have cracked the femur open to look at the fat content of the marrow, see how, how healthy the animal was when it was actually killed. What are the risks? What, why are we going about trying to uh, eliminate the disease from the wildlife and from cattle? I guess the first and foremost reason is for human safety. Um, you know, people can get bovine tuberculosis. It's very closely re related to human uh, tuberculosis. Tracking the elk in winter is the easy part. All it takes is a couple of snowsuit cowboys and a metal bird. These researchers think nothing of leaping off a helicopter and wrestling an elk to the ground. We capture elk, usually in February. Um, we use a, a net gun fired out of a helicopter. It uh, basically entraps the animal. The helicopter crew lands beside it, draws blood. Um, that blood is gonna be used to uh, run three different blood tests on it for the presence of bovine tuberculosis. Temporary GPS collars upload an animal's location every two to three hours giving parks a great picture of daily and seasonal movements and preferred habitat. They will actually use the landscape outside the park as an as a opportunity to uh, have their young. They spend the summertime outside the park and then we'll move back into the park. So we've got all these transboundary uh, movements. 
If blood tests reveal that an elk is diseased, they track the collar signal, recapture the animal, and do a full necropsy. Outside the park, hunters submit samples from elk and deer as part of the hunter surveillance program. Necropsies like this one allow park scientists to cross-reference their information with local hunters and combine the data into one huge map of where the disease is found and where it's not. Elk with bovine tuberculosis and deer seem to be really confined to the west end of the park and uh, in, a, in a relatively small area. And that's where we're really concentrating our current program. Um, well, it's believed to be at about um, 6% uh, for elk in the west end and for, for deer, maybe slightly over 1%. But in general, it's not a very large proportion of the elk that have the disease. Many cattle producers that live here practice sustainable farming, impacting the land as little as possible. It's a, a very, very gentle, natural transition. There isn't an abrupt change of, of, in, of landscape, you know, where it's farming, national park. In 1998, Ray Armbruster's entire herd was eliminated when one cow tested positive for TB. You're still on doing the same thing you He want. knows better than anyone what's at risk. It's a scorched earth policy where all your animals are destroyed. You know, your, your cows, uh, your, your newborn calves, whatever, uh, they're all removed. I mean, you could have just one positive animal in 200 and they're all removed. This is one of my prized possessions, Ken. Isn't he something? I've raised top gaining bulls at Douglas off of this bull. Oh, oh, Gus. And he's very gentle. Oh, oh. Shared food resources and grooming are the main ways the disease can spread. A round bale left in a field is a classic example where an elk or a deer might be feeding at that bale. Then the farmer comes, feeds that bale to his cattle, and the, the, the transmission could occur that way. A major component of eliminating the disease is barrier fences. They are used to stop deer and elk from entering the feed area and sharing cattle hay bales. By focusing TB management activities in a small geographical area and working with other government agencies and local cattle producers, Parks Canada hopes to eradicate the disease. We've tested in excess of 200,000 head of cattle and removed far more animals than, you know, wildlife populations. And it'll continually go on this way. This local issue influences the way cattle producers do business. Their contributions instrumental in helping to stop the spread of TB. We're mitigating aggressively. Like on my own farm, I don't know what more I can do. You know, I manage the whole landscape on the whole year, summer and winter, of trying to reduce that interaction. I can't do really any more than I'm doing. There is no consensus on the next step forward, but one thing is for certain. Parks must continue to balance community stakeholders with wildlife needs. Wolves prey on, on elk. Uh, bears prey on elk. Elk maintain the vegetation the way it is, the way we see it today. So th they have a really important part to play in the ecosystem. And so anytime the, that, that humans try to manipulate the system, it always seems to backfire on us. We can't ignore it. It just would be totally incompatible to allow wildlife, you know, in other areas or across the province to become endemically affected with uh, 
a disease such as tuberculosis, it would be a terrible conflict. We don't live in a landscape like that anymore that you can allow those things to happen. We really don't have any interest in seeing elk disappear from, from this, this you know, beautiful environment. And I don't think landowners do either. This is a little bump in the road. We know that the elk and, and deer are gonna persist on the landscape. We'll manage it, we'll get it out, and, and in the future, um, we'll be back to, to a healthy and sustainable herd that, uh, that moves across the, the, the park line. Managing this living legacy is an ongoing challenge that requires the concerted efforts of both government and landowners. If wildlife uh, want to interact or be on the landscape on our, on our farm, I mean, they still have absolute access like they have in the past and probably will always in the future. Making tough decisions for humans and wildlife is the price civilization must pay in order to keep its wilderness for all to enjoy.